Hello and welcome to the night studio in our program, Pulitzer at 100, The Photographers. Our co-sponsor for our celebration of the Pulitzer Centennial is Nikon. Our Pulitzer Gallery is one of the most popular here at the museum. Right now it's under renovation, but we're privileged to have with us two Pulitzer Prize winning photographers, Ken Geiger on the far end and William Snyder. Ken and William won a Pulitzer in 1993 while at the Dallas Morning News for their photographs of the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona. Ken now works for National Geographic where he's Deputy Director of Photography. And William is a freelance photographer whose clients include Time, Life, Sports Illustrated, The New York Times Sunday Magazine, and USA Today. Please welcome Ken Geiger and William Snyder. You. you know, I have to say that William has won four Pulitzers, uh, one for Katrina, uh, one on a story about AIDS babies in Romania, and a story about how the National Transportation Safety Board conducts its investigations. Right. Yeah. Could you fix your mic? It's My mic is booming. I, I don't know what it's doing, but it doesn't sound like you're doing great. Chris, is that coming through on your end? Well, no. <coughs> what the other sound like? Can you hear me? I'm sorry? Hello, hello. Hello? The other two are coming fine. Okay. And, and mine isn't, but it is in the control room, so I will just continue to project. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start talking a little bit about Pulitzer, and I want to hear from each of you. What does it represent to you? What does it represent to the industry? What does it feel like to win one? Bill, start with you. Oh, that's the question they always ask. Um, you know, it, it, especially in this day and age, it, it represents uh, quality storytelling. And in this particular instance, quality visual storytelling. Uh, the, the quality of the imagery, the quality of the storytelling has, has gone up so much in the last, oh, 30 years, 40 years, as far as the entries are concerned. Uh, it, it's a recognition of, of generally what we hope is, is really good work. Um, as far as personally, it was one of those things that sort of allowed me to kind of do the things that I wanted to do. Uh, it, it gave me a certain amount of clout in the newsroom, and as a photographer, you don't always have that, you know. So it, it, it gave us, you know, it gave me, gave Ken, and the rest of us at the Dallas Morning News photo department back in those days, it gave us a lot more uh, clout in the newsroom. Ken, what did it mean to you personally, and what do you feel the prize does for professional photography, news photography? Um, Pulitzer is like, uh, I don't know, you, you walk into the 7-Eleven and you buy a lottery ticket, and you, you know, you, you kind of hope you're going to win, but you, you know you're not going to. Uh, we need to get our engineer in the back to, I guess, turn up the house sound a little bit. Um, so that we make sure that it's getting out to the audience. Okay, go ahead. Um, anyway, so you, you, never th you never think you're going to hear one. You just never hear one. Uh, you never think you're going to win one. But when you when you do, it's uh, it's a pretty happy moment. Um, Career-wise, I'll have to just echo what William said. It's uh, it changes your position in the newsroom. Photography sometimes, um, especially a while ago, wasn't, it's almost like a necessary evil in some newsrooms. Um, and uh, when you're part of the Pulitzer team, you can, you know, you can stand proud. You can stand on your own two feet in the newsroom and go toe to toe and start talking about being a department of origin rather than a service department. And it's, uh, it changes the dynamic some. We've got your images from the 1992 Barcelona Olympics on the screen. We're going to be talking about a lot of these photos as we go forth. Right now, I'm uh, you know, trying to uh, stay uh, generally. The Olympics are underway again. Uh, do those memories from Barcelona come back to you every time <laughs> there's an Olympiad? Yeah, every yeah, time. Yeah. What, do you, what, do you, what, what, what hangs with you the longest or, or, or the most? Well, you just uh, watching the opening ceremonies last night, you can, you can see the pageantry, the spectacle, the fireworks, and, you know, see the athletes coming in. Um, 
But the Olympics are, are special beyond belief until you've, you've been, you know, next to the athletes that are setting world records in the track or seeing them win the volleyball gold medal or something like that. The, the energy is, I, I don't, it's, it's undescribable. It, it's the most amazing thing I've ever been witness to in my life. After doing several Olympics, it's like, wow, you just want to keep going back. It's, you watch them last night and you're going, ooh, I wish I was in Rio and <laughs> not in DC today. You know? it's, it's a really special thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and TV doesn't do it justice, sorry. I mean, you can, you, if you ever get a chance to go, it's, it's amazing. Well, to me, the, th the thing about it is, uh, you know, this is the culmination of, uh, or, yeah, the culmination of these athletes' careers in many, many instances. And, you know, if they're running the 100, they, they've worked all their lives, and they're either in there and they move on to the next round, or they're done, mm -hmm. and that's it. Mm -hmm. And so the energy, as he says, the energy, um, and I wouldn't call it stress because... Uh, they're incredibly loose considering, mm -hmm. but, but the energy that, that exists at these games is just, is just amazing. Uh, and, and I love it because it's so emotional for everybody, you know, and I, there are times even when I would get emotional and, and I, maybe with Ken, I don't know, but sometimes when you look through the lens and this stuff is happening in front of you, you can't help but be drawn into it. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's one of the most wonderful things you can do. Well, so, we, go ahead. And, and we also have license to be close. That, that tag hanging around your, your neck that says EP on it means you're a photographer, you can go pretty much any place. And so when you're standing 10 feet away from somebody that just, you know, set a world record, it's, it's, a, it's pretty cool. I want to stop on, on this frame right here uh, because, um, and it's funny, Ken, I think you said it, I'd never seen a bronze medal celebration quite so vigorous. Tell me about this frame. Well, the, um, this is right, uh, if you can see the turn right there, that, so that was the finish line, it's just behind them. Um, the photographer stand was probably about as, as big as the, the stands here. I mean, that many photographers, and we probably a couple hundred people, I mean, at the end of the finish line. And everybody with their long lenses tight like this. And, um, you know, the U.S. women had won the gold medal. They were all, you know, prancing around the stadium with their flags and everything like that. And the third place was basically almost a dead heat and so there was a uh, a delay on announcing who won third place to take the bronze and the Nigerian team was just right in right in front of us and uh, it was actually hard to shoot because you had the big long lenses on the monopods and this was right in front so you had to like you know try to get your cameras around and try to you know shoot them celebrating right in front of you and I think that's mainly almost the last frame on the roll of film mm -hmm. and that was this was film so it's you know 36 frames and you're out and you can't reload because you've got you know two other photographers side by side <laughs> well and the other thing too that's great about this that this shows I mean uh, maybe you've heard this thing you know gold medal is it mm -hmm. well you know you win a silver it means you kind of lost. You didn't, you didn't get the gold, but the bronze means you actually won something, that, you, that you're not out of the money. And so, you know, we've seen it happen over and over and over again. The third place sometimes go cra goes crazier than the gold does. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah. and, it's, and it's a wonderful picture that just captures that. Uh, it's, it's also a picture that, I mean, I'm, I'm slightly embarrassed because it's part of a Pulitzer portfolio because, and it gets used a lot over and over again because it's a bunch of happy people. Most of the Pulitzers mm -hmm. are of mm -hmm. famine, murder, things like that. And, but there's a number of other photographers, Bill Frakes, 
um, David Burnett, they all have similar frames of this. So um, it, it's become a picture that's, you know, get used, but <coughs> there's other people that have this too, so it, it's not that He's expected. being modest. Right. Yes, they don't have is. it as well as he does. <laughs> yeah. I want to talk about this image uh, because the, the Olympics are all about the sport, but they're also about the place where they're held. Tell me about when this picture was taken and, and when it was used in the paper. Okay, so uh, let me just give you a little bit of background. Uh, Ken and I were working at the Olympics and it was, it was one of the first times that the photography people at the Olympics were sort of like, do what you wanna do. And so he and I would have meetings every morning uh, with, with the sports writers or late at night when we were all done, what are we going to do the next day? And so we wanted, we always wanted to be where the big story was going to be. Well, from that position, this is uh, evidently they have an outdoor diving uh, uh, thing venue. In, in venue in Brazil, but this was the, normally diving is indoors mm -hmm. and it's in a crappy place, pardon my French, and this was on the side of the mountain and it, it was, mm -hmm. it's, it's really kind of an easy picture to get. But what Ken and I decided was we're not going to use this picture because the first day of sort of practice in the early rounds, everybody shot a similar frame mm -hmm. and everybody ran it. And we told the newspaper, do not run any of these pictures at all until the medal round. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't. And again, this was one of those things. Uh, this is Mary Ellen Clark. Uh, she almost wasn't a diver anymore. She had a really bad case of vertigo, managed to get over it somehow, yeah. competed in the Olympics, and she got a bronze, mm -hmm. which was totally unexpected. So I made this picture, and everybody else was shoot, had to shoot really, really tight on that day mm -hmm. because they'd already run this picture. <laughs> and so I, I got this, and it was, in many ways, it was kind of easy. Um, and the newspaper ran it six columns all the way across the front of the paper. So, yeah. it, you know, it's one of those things where when the photographers on the scene are journalists, and that's the big thing that, that, that we want to talk about, not just interested in, in photography or, or sports, but we're journalists, uh, it, it makes a big difference. Ken had a picture, uh, I don't know if it's in your selection here, Ken had one of the hurdles with the stadium in the background. Right. Uh, and again, yeah, it was cool. one of those things where it's like, you know, hold off on these pictures. And it made all the difference in the world in our, in our coverage overall. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if, you, if you're not careful, you're running the same pictures day in and day yeah. out, day in and day out, and your readers get <laughs> bored with them. Right. I'm sorry, that photo isn't in here. But let me ask you this, because, um, and I know for those of you who don't know, William, you've said before that, um, it's got to be the link with the human effort that mm -hmm. draws the audience to the event through the photograph. Mm -hmm. um, you go to any Olympiad and there are a lot of outside issues beyond the competition. And certainly in Rio, uh, we have a whole basket full from a government in crisis to worldwide terrorism uh, to Zika, uh, garbage in the water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm guessing as a photojournalist that you have to have an awareness of that stuff tucked away every day when you're on your way to the venues to shoot the athletic competition. Yep. How do you compartmentalize that and then stay aware enough to be able to shift gears if there's an opportunity to make a picture? Well, <laughs> we did that in Atlanta. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. I mean, during the <coughs> Olympics in Atlanta, there was the bombing in the park. Right, yeah. yes. And uh, so we went from full-on sports to covering a news event, basically, mm -hmm. and and being locked out of our offices because the, they were right next to the to the park. So mm -hmm. um, it, it was challenging. At what point is it a help? And what point is it a distraction? I mean, because you have to go in with the awareness. It's not something that you pick up once you're there. Well, you have to you have to plan on it too. Depending upon where the Olympics are and what part of the world, and like in Barcelona, they're in Spain. You have what? We had five or six hours. Well, in Texas, we might have had seven hours of delay there. 
and you have to think about deadlines of the newspaper and when's the latest you can work to make the deadlines. So when we're planning our day out and events that are happening in the evening in Barcelona, we can work up till like one or two o'clock in the morning and still make our deadlines in Dallas. What's that do to you when you're working three <laughs> weeks straight, basically? Right. You're working up to two, three o'clock in the morning, yeah. and then you have to get on a bus and go back to the press mm -hmm. where the, the housing is, which was, I think, a, like a 45 minute ride, and get two hours sleep, get up, grab some breakfast, get back on the bus, go to the press center, and then go to the swimming venue and get in line with a ticket at 7 a.m. so you could be in and get a decent seat. Mm -hmm. So you, we literally, if we were lucky, you got two hours of sleep a night. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what's going on in Spain. In, in Rio, you're on, you're on East Coast in U.S. time. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a different way of thinking. You have, to, you have to plan your day based on deadlines, based mm -hmm. on the time zone you're in, and what you can actually accomplish. Mm -hmm. When you get to the Olympics, how much of the, the personality, how do, you, how do you manage the competition with other photographers of where you want to be and, and, and what angle you want to have and, and then recalculating that as, as options maybe fall apart? Well, I mean, it, this is one of the things that I think we're the most proud of uh, in Barcelona is because uh, we had the same access that almost everybody else did. But it, it's a matter of thinking things through and maybe not always doing the same thing that everybody else is doing and working for, you know, working in a way where you're trusted, where your, you know, your judgment is trusted. Back at the paper. Back at the paper. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, it's like, uh, for example, this picture right here, this is one of those things that, if you notice, the stadium is basically empty. Mm -hmm. I like to poke fun at, at the photographers that are there on the infield that, you know, that didn't take this picture. Mm -hmm. uh, I've said this over and over, and it's quoted in a lot of different places. I just enjoyed the fact that we basically kicked a lot of people's butts doing this because, yeah, there were people there at the same places that we were, but I think we all went about it smarter. Ken had this wonderful picture of uh, the, the Vince, well, I guess he was Russian at that point, yeah. Russian pole vaulter, Sergei Bubka, who mm -hmm. had dominated the sport for decades and basically had three attempts and he was gone. And Ken, instead of sort of being at, at, at uh, down on the floor of the stadium, he had decided to go up into the stands and shoot pretty much eye level with him. And so he's got a picture that nobody else had. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and it was on and on and on like that. Uh, the picture I have of the, of the handoff in the 4 by 100 there was literally one other person over there with me mm -hmm. where I did it. I had, sco I had scouted this, this out uh, after the, the, you know, the anchor leg handoff, and I had scouted it out earlier in the day, made it, and, and actually did a test on, on a preliminary, whatever it was, uh, event and made some adjustments and came and I, it was the night I was doing the uh, uh, the basketball finals and I literally walked into the into the stadium Ken was doing track and field and I literally walked into the stadium f went to my spot stood there for about I don't know 20 minutes before the final came on mm -hmm. they came around I fired through it pulled the film out put it in an envelope handed it to a person that takes it, and then I went to basketball. Mm -hmm. So this was mm -hmm. all I did that day. Mm -hmm. And Ken, you know, Ken has the, the finish line stuff and all the rejoicing, and we were covered, you know, we were just smart about how we covered things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there were, I have to add that there was, I think there were like 650 accredited photographers there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a couple people, it's like, Sometimes it was a serious crowd, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it was, and it was, especially when Carl Lewis would show up. Yeah, and it was, and, and at basketball too. I mean, it was, you know, it was the best of the best. Uh, the picture didn't make it into this edit, but um, we'd been shooting at the diving, mm -hmm. and everybody had been shooting the same picture over and over and over and over again. And one day, I happened to look up, and I noticed that 
from where I was, from where we were all sitting, and literally they had things, and you just went and you just sat. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't hard. Uh, I noticed that there was a big Olympic sign, uh, you know, graphic behind the divers and everything. And so I kind of looked over, and I noticed there were stands on this side across the pool. So I just kind of one day I walked down there and kind of looked and scoped it out a little bit and didn't didn't say anything to anybody. And there was a uh, I think there was a, a, a springboard event, and U.S. guy did pretty well. And so I went over there, and I was the only one over there, mm -hmm. and I shot it. And so what you had was the big Olympic graphic with the with the rings and all that stuff. Nobody had done it, so. I got that, and it not only were we giving pictures to the Dallas Morning News, but they were going out over Knight Ritter Tribune, a big newswire back then with some really great picture papers. That picture went out, and everybody went nuts. I came in the next day, and everybody was everybody was over there now. <laughs> so, and then I went back and just stayed where I'd been. I mean, you know, and that's the thing when you go to something like this, where you've got good access, but it's still limited over a lot of things just trying something different, like Ken going up into the stands mm -hmm. and, and paying attention to what's going on, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, being a good journalist. Mm -hmm. You were shooting film back then, as you just said. Um, mm -hmm. That's almost another century ago. What difference Thanks does today's... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I used I'm to feeling shoot... kind of old, but now I feel really old. Right. I, I used <laughs> to shoot television news film, and people say, what, what? Yeah. But... Um, um, the technology, the advances in the technology is a practical matter. What is that doing for the photographers who are in Rio right now? Wow, it's that's like a, it is a different century. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, you, you, you're probably not gonna run out of film like I did shooting the track and field. Um, uh, the delay's not there, it's almost instantaneous. You have uh, wire service photographers that have laptops with cards and uh, they're shooting and transmitting real time back to their agencies. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had, um, I think we bought like 200 rolls of film um, to take with us to Barcelona because we knew that Kodak would process our film. Kodak uh, is one of the sponsors. They have a press center. You, if you send in a roll of film in a little envelope with a courier, it goes back to the press center, it gets processed, you pick it up, and then they, Kodak replaces it because mm -hmm. they want you to shoot Kodak film and they wanted the Olympics photos on Kodak film too. So it was a good deal. So we shot, I don't know, seven, 800 rolls of film all together and only took 200 with us. Um, but that was a multi-hour thing. You know, mm -hmm. That was the fastest way to do it, to have someone on a scooter go from you know, the wrestling venue, take it back to the press center, and by the time you got back that evening, you'd have 30 rolls of film to look at, to edit, mm -hmm. and go through, where they're doing it probably on their iPhones right sure. now. So, sure, yeah. sure. Well, and, then and, and even some right now, they're tethered to the, to the internet, and it just goes directly to their yeah. feeds back either back at the main press center or New York, London, Paris, someplace like that. I yeah. mean, you can now, for places like the New York Times and stuff, you can sit there and you can sort of, they have these feeds, Sports Illustrated I think does it, you can sit there and you can just watch, mm -hmm. you can watch the pictures drop in in real time. Mm -hmm. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty amazing, but it's a little daunting. I actually, I, I, I understand all of that, but I actually kind of don't like that because you know, to have the ability for the photographers on site to kind of look at the stuff and say, okay, this is, this is the moment. And that's the other thing, too, is that they're shooting at such high frame rates now. I mean, you know, we used to shoot at, what, five and a half, six frames a, a second. Now they're 10, 12. I mean, it's almost like a movie. 14. 14. Is it 14 now? Oh, jeez. It's like you shooting know, video. Yeah, it's like shooting video, and that's the thing is, you know, it comes down to, all of this stuff is flying by an editor who's just kind of going, that one, mm -hmm. that one, mm -hmm. that one, you know. And that's where I wanted to go next, because for an editor, for a photographer in the field, there's this new capability, not only of the frame rate at which you can shoot, but the fact that probably your news organization has a website that can take material. Does that require more discipline of the photographer? Does that require kind of a, a more of a, a reminder from the editor 
Don't send me back a thousand frames. We used to have we used to have uh, film ratios in the newsroom for for you know shooting film because once it's exposed, you can't use it again. And so if they and this was you know movie film for television. So if they sent you out on a uh, what was going to be a 30 second voiceover and you shot 150 feet of film, you were in trouble because yeah. uh, you don't need to be doing that. Where are we now in terms of the capability of photography? And then once again, the position of the photographer to use some discretion, to use some experience, and, and yet to, to take a risk. <laughs> you want to try? Yeah. <laughs> um. Well, I, I don't think there's a big difference. I mean, sure, there's a big difference in technology now, mm -hmm. digital versus film. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's like a night and day thing. But as far as what's being produced, mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at any web page, what do they have? They have a lead image. You look at the New York Times or the, the Post, they'll have one photo there. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how many you shoot. All it takes is one good one mm -hmm. to be the entry page on, on that, whatever whatever it is, whether it's print or or internet. Mm -hmm. um, sure, they put a lot of extras behind it on the internet now. They're looking for, you know, it's basically clickbait. They want <laughs> they want the ad impressions, um, but it's still the photographer's job to communicate to an audience to show them that they show them something they can't see for themselves. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. We, we, we freeze stuff in time. Mm -hmm. you know? So I don't, I don't see that that's changed much. Okay. Yeah, that part of it hasn't changed much. But, you know, I've been around enough these days to see people, they, you know, if they can shoot 14 frames a second, they're going to shoot 14 frames a second. I can't, I can't do it. I, I go blind. I, the thing keeps going up and down, and I go blind. I can't see anything. But, you know, what that does, though, is that does create the, the need for picture editors that are really, really good mm -hmm. and can get to that picture. You know, if you do 14 a second and you shoot a burst of three seconds, I mean, you've got a whole roll of film there, 36 frames. So they've got to be able to go through that and find that moment. Mm -hmm. and, and people are getting better and better and better at it. So, you know, it's like Ken says. Our job is still to freeze that moment, and, and, and we know what we're looking for. I can't always describe it, but we know what we're looking for, and we're trying to capture it, and, and it still gets out there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's the beauty, as, as Ken said, that's the beauty of still photography. It allows you, as the viewer, to study that split second of time. Yeah, you know, motion has its thing too, but there's that split second where you can just sit there and you can look around at the picture and you, you know, you can see the faces, you can see the muscles taut, you can see, you know, their shoes untied, whatever it is. And, and, and so, for example, like this picture that's up right now, I mean, you get to really see, oh my goodness, they're both off the ground mm -hmm. and they're doing this. And, and see the expressions on their faces. And you don't even get that when it's moving. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that's the beauty of the still picture, and that has not changed at all. Another thing that's changed is that most of us here are walking around with cell phones with cameras in them. And you're seeing photographs uploaded hit or no. What's that doing to the expectation on the part of a reader of what photography can bring? What's it doing to the appreciation, the aesthetic, or is it too soon to ask these things? Because it really is, you know, a, a, a fire hose full of content uh, coming at us every day. I, I've, I've heard this argued any number of ways, but uh, one way you can look at it is that the, the job of the photojournalist, the professional photographer, is more important than ever. Um, and quality content, um, the decisive moment, the, the pictures that are telling stories that move the dial, whether it's, uh, you know, on global politics or a famine or war, um, they still set themselves above the billions of photos that are being shot mm -hmm. every year. Mm -hmm. um, 
there, there may be a plethora of images being made now, but more importantly, I think, is that we have and continue to use photography as a communication tool that, that moves the dial. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe people, since everybody's shooting pictures, they all realize how important that is because they're trying to make pictures in their own lives that are important to them now, and they can do it easier now than they've ever mm -hmm. had in their lives. They don't have to go into a dark room and process and print and mm -hmm. you know, go to the drugstore and pick up their prints. It's all on their you know, smartphones. Well, I, I want to expand a little bit on, on what Ken is saying because I now teach, and so this is, a, this is a big part of what I try to explain to my students and to people in general who say, well, anybody can do this now. And it's like, no, not anybody can do this because what, what Ken is saying, and uh, I want to expand it a little bit more, is what photojournalists do, what we do, is we tell stories. Storytelling is the key to what it, what it is that we do, whether it's a single picture or a group of pictures. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to make a, you know, when Ken and I were first starting out, we went to school together, you know, there was a certain amount of magic involved in taking pictures. There were dark rooms and there were potions and red lights and, and all of that, and you needed to know all that just to make a picture. Well, now with your cell phone, you know, you can shoot a relatively clear, in focus, sharp, you know, well-exposed frame and send it to 50 of your closest friends around the world in no time. Mm -hmm. That doesn't take a skill, but telling a story takes skill. Mm -hmm. Understanding the situation and being able to tell that story is the skill. And um, I look at it this way, the, 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 the iPhone, because you know, uh, there are all other things, but the iPhone <laughs> is the one that really started it. The iPhone is now like the pen. Mm -hmm. Everybody can take a picture, everybody can write but not everybody can, is a writer and not everybody is a photographer. Mm -hmm. And so, as, as a friend of ours says, uh, storytelling, visual storytelling is a boutique skill. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to do. There are people that can make really nice pictures, but to tell a story is, is what the difference is. I mean, you know, when Ken worked at National Geographic, I mean, that was the thing. You look at those photographers' work, and it's because they can tell that story, not just because they make beautiful pictures. Mm -hmm. If you want to see, you know, beautiful pictures and see how relatively easy it is, just look at National Geographic's amateur, you know, contest. Mm -hmm. There are some amazing pictures in there. Mm -hmm. But you can't, you know, you can't tell somebody, great, you did that, go do it again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they can't tell a story with it. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. just make a bunch of pictures. Mm -hmm. So that's, good. that's the difference. We have microphones on each side of the room, so if you have a question, raise your hand, and one of our visitor services volunteers will get you a microphone. While they're doing that, I want each of you to give our audience, if you could give them one tip that will make them a better photographer, what would it be? I mean, understanding that we're shooting events in our lives. Okay. Um. My, I guess my one usual tip is to think about composition in a little bit different way. And that's to think, how does your brain work? What do you see first? Do you see light and dark first? You'll see, you'll see light before you see dark. But um, when you're looking at an image, there's always one thing that you see first. If you don't see one thing first, the image is probably not successful. It's probably flat. But if I'm sitting right here and I'm framing this scene right now, William's in front. He's the entry point into the photograph. And when you, when you frame something, do it intentionally. Think about, it creates either a square if you're shooting for Instagram or a rectangle or whatever format. You're intentionally creating a frame. And that frame needs to have something that's an entry point. And the more interesting the entry point, the more successful an image is gonna be. Sometimes that entry point is a moment, it's joy, it's the blowing out of a birthday candle. Um, it, can, it can be anything. Or it can be something as simple as, okay, I'm gonna change the position of my framing so that the flower is in the foreground and it's what you see first and then you see the mountains in the background. 
so you have a layering and a composition going on. So, entry point. I'll give you two very simple things. Look at the background, the background of your picture. If it's messy, if it doesn't add a layer, as, as Ken said, try to clean it up by moving around. And then the other thing is, um, from a great photographer from many, many years ago by the name of Robert Kappa, your pictures aren't good enough, you're not close enough. And so the thing that I see with so many people is they stand back too far, especially with the iPhones and whatever. You know, you might want to zoom, but, you know, get closer. Because the other thing that that does is it allows you to feel, the viewer to feel a little more intimate with the situation. So, you know, just get closer. Even if it's just one step closer, it's going to be that much better. Okay. I think we have a question up here in the audience. Yes, we've got a microphone for you. Thank you. You mentioned uh, kind of planning out your day at the Olympics ahead of time, and when you've got 20, 30 different kinds of events going on, all sometimes all at the same time, and you mentioned you'd camp out maybe at the track and field, and that makes sense because there's a lot of big names at the track and field, but what about the more obscure sports? Would you ever get out and do the you know canoeing or ping pong, badminton, the stuff that might have some great stories and might have some great shots behind it, but don't have any stars at all, people that nobody's really ever heard of. But how, how would you think about divvying well, up your time to some of the stuff we had, that's... We had to balance our, our time because we, we knew that there were, there were big events that had to be covered. Um, we had to... There's, there's things that happen early in the day. There's things that take all day long. You're a track and field, you're, you're stuck there all day. It's hard to get out. Um, and the locations around the Olympic site. How long does it take you to get to shoot wrestling? Can I leave track and field to go shoot wrestling? Um, we, would, we would look at the logistics of getting around because you have to take buses. There's no two ways about that. It's transportation supplied by the Olympics. And then we had to look at the big name events. Who, who matters to the Dallas community? Because we were the Dallas Morning News. Um, who were the big international, national things? What, what things do we have to cover? And then how can we sneak out and make some synchronized swimming photos because they just look so cool? <laughs> and, and, and balance that with being just, you know, wanting to shoot good photographs and, and have to cover the event. What we did, what we started doing... And then share, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that was one of the things is, we, you know, because we didn't want to end up standing next to each other ever, ever. Mm -hmm. And we didn't often cover the same events because there was just the two of us. So, you know, we decided beforehand which events, you know, major events. He wanted to do track and field and swimming. I wanted to do uh, uh, diving and basketball. So it worked out perfectly. I mean, literally, the, the, this track and field picture was the only thing I really shot at track and field because we had discussed it, and I said, can I come in and do this on my way to basketball? And he's like, yeah, sure. Uh, but one of the things that we did was, it was what, next to the last day or whatever? We sort of tried to see how many events we could shoot in a day. <laughs> we, have our own mini Olympics. we had our own mini Olympics, and I think I shot eight. <laughs> and it was it was really hard. And I ran out of film, and I was shooting water polo with film that was meant for indoors because I didn't have anything else. So I shot water polo with like 1,000 Kodak, and it was just it wasn't it wasn't pretty, but I got a decent picture of it. But literally, come in and. No news value per se, just looking for cool pictures. Come in, I can remember going, coming into a venue, shooting for 15, 20 minutes, and then going out and grabbing a bus and going to the next one. And uh -huh. indoor handball is another one. Yeah. Makes great, great yeah. pictures. Oh, yeah. And it really is an adventure. I had the opportunity to cover the 88 Winter Olympics in Calgary uh, for Gannett for 10 TV stations, and it was our executive producer, photographer, editor, and me. And our first day there, we were at the mall, and they were having a special. You could get a maple leaf uh, applique ironed onto a T-shirt for $5, and you could add letters. So we all made T-shirts for ourselves, calling us Three Guys TV. And that's who <laughs> we were <laughs> representing. What's your favorite sport to shoot, each of you? 
Oh, I have to say track and field. Uh huh. It's just uh, it's pretty pretty special. Mm -hmm. I like uh, I actually the, it, it's it's sort of two things. I like basketball and I like gymnastics. Mm -hmm. I love gymnastics. Um, it's just it's beautiful, but yet it's incredibly athletic. It's very very emotional. Mm -hmm. You know so. Mm -hmm. Very good. We have another question over here. Yes. Uh, right here. Okay. Uh, my name is Ron, and I'm from uh, Michigan. Mm -hmm. uh, if I were you guys, I couldn't resist being next to somebody that's just awesome and, and looking for somebody to take my picture with them. <laughs> how, does that, how does that work? Because I, I know you must have the urge, but you don't do it, I guess. It's just one of those no-nos. Yeah, don't you dare. just, I mean, yeah. there are some people in our business that do that, but that's only when they sort of get to know people. No, I mean, that's one of the things that I, now that I don't shoot every day anymore, I sort of lament not having some of those pictures, but like he says, it's just not cool, you know. And, and you've got, and you've got to, re, and, and I mean, I hate to say this, you've got to remain really cool because, you know, when you're doing that, something else could be happening mm -hmm. and you could be missing it. Mm -hmm. And it's a generational thing too, because I mean, it was it was certain that when we started into the build business, our elders told us this is not cool. Yeah. You're here to work, and 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 I have friends of mine that are younger now getting into the business, and 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 it's it's what they do. Here I am at the White House. Yeah, you know, and, selfies. And it's on it's on Facebook. You know, yeah. I said we would never do. That. <laughs> Thanks for your question. Sure. We have another one out here. Well, yes. This lady up here. Okay. Hi. Hello. Have I hi. Um, have either of you ever taken either a single picture or a series of pictures that you guys thought were too beautiful, too fantastic to and because you thought so highly of the picture that you just decided to keep it to yourself and not publish it? <laughs> <laughs> no. <Good. laughs> no. I wish I had a bunch of those. That's pretty <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, I mean I you know, uh, Ken is different. Ken shoots different kinds of pictures than I do, especially now. Most of mine aren't be aren't beautiful. <laughs> I, I have a tendency. This is one of the happier things that I've ever done. I uh, I don't make a lot of pictures you want to hang on your wall. Let's put it that way. <laughs> you know, it's interesting though. Um, going back to your comment about the human element, that that's what ties us all together. But Ken, it's fair to say that now the environment is certainly a part of you know the human experience and and you're clearly trying to link us and make us care about the environment and and the animals they're in now i'm going to take a big left turn we've got cougars and coyotes and whales and penguins riding around with GoPros. That's your competition now. <laughs> They're living their lives under the camera. Now, but, but, but seriously, I mean, take the first part first. The going out and shooting wildlife, what was that like for you uh, as, as a change from the typical news photography and going back to the ubiquitous digital age, you too have competition from Mother Nature herself in terms of getting images of, of the animals you're studying. Well, if you, if you think about wildlife photography um, and sports photography, they're, they're not that different. And I mean, all of these images, they, they revolve around um, moments, they're emotional moments. And with, with any kind of wildlife scene, any animal pretty much, you're looking for the same thing. And that's that's a body language that's a little bit different. That's gonna gonna be the entry point into a photograph, and combine that with you know the prime times of you know morning light, evening light. Mm -hmm. That's gonna make something um, beautiful, or the scenery that it's that that animal is in. I mean, that's that's what you're looking for with wildlife photography. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something to set it apart from the rest. Okay. We have another question from the audience. Hello. Hi, Bill. Jeannie hey. Adam Smith from uh, Western Kentucky University. Um, like William, I teach um, students who are going into this field. And I was just curious from both of you guys um, uh, if you could comment a little bit on kind of the future 
flow of students getting into visual communications and being storytellers. You know, I have a lot of students who say they don't want to go into newspapers, and I can understand where they're coming from, but at the same time, traditionally, I still see that as a good foundation for students to understand storytelling, ethics. Um, can you kind of speak to where you kind of see students kind of flowing uh, in the future um, with this career path? Go for it. Okay. Um, well, I think it's a great time to be a photojournalist right now because everybody, you know, everybody is beginning to understand visual storytelling. Um, I'm not, I'm not quite as bullish on newspapers as you are. Uh, I think, unfortunately, we're in a we're in a trough. We we're going to come out of it just like we have before, and I recommend that my students go and do that. But there are so many other options out there now. Uh, there's so many different avenues for photography and photojournalism specifically, whether it's you know various websites, uh, non-governmental organizations, um, you know wildlife organizations, uh, universities, um, federal agencies, on on and on and on. Visual storytelling is still there. And then the other thing is we've sort of I'm glad you brought this up because this we've sort of really touched on it. 14 frames a second means there's a ton of pictures. Someone that understands storytelling has to be able to look at those pictures and pick the right ones and be able to put it together in storytelling, uh, in a storytelling fashion. So, for example, where I teach at RIT, we have a big, big emphasis on picture editing. Uh, not curating, not just picking things, but actually picture editing and trying to make stories you know, or, or, or working with bodies of work to, to get through all of, these, all of these images. You know, like Ken said, you know, we shot 700 rolls of film. Uh, that's what, about 20, 26, well, I can't do the math. You, you do it, 700 times 36. Now they're probably shooting 10 times that much. On any given story, I and mean, I, I went to Romania and did, and I was there for two weeks and did like six, seven stories and I shot less than 100 rolls of film. That's, you know, 3,600 frames. I have kids in my class that'll go out and they'll come back and they'll have 3,600 rolls on one event. I mean, 3,600 frames on one event. So storytelling now and being able to edit those pictures is even more important than it has ever been. And, and you think about what the world is like out there. There are very few publications anymore outside of newspapers that hire writers anymore. What they do is it's all freelance writers. Who do they have on their staff? They have editors. And you find this in more and more publications and websites and stuff. They're hiring editors to go through all the pictures that are all there. So I think as far as being a shooter and being in this business and wanting to tell stories visually, we're in a golden age. If your star and your wagon is hitched to, to newspapers, you know, there are still great ones out there but not like it used to be. And so you've got to look. Uh, you know, I've got kids that go to work for the White House and they're doing all kinds of stuff. Uh, social media, shooting pictures, sh shooting video. I've got kids that, that uh, you know, that went to Time Magazine and her, I had a, had a woman and all she did for a year was work on A Year in Space. And she was, she was an editor, she did interviews and, and they had a special edition and they just gave it to her, you know, and said, here, you edit this and put this thing together. So there's lots of, there's lots of avenues out there. It's just not, I mean, it used to be, let's say you had 500 entities with, you know, 10 jobs a piece. Now you've got, you know, 50,000 with one mm -hmm. each. And so I just think it's a, it's a great time. Yeah. You know, last month we had uh, 2016 feature photography winner Jessica Rinaldi here. She did a, a gallery talk, and when she was done, uh, one of the visitors, nine or ten-year-old girl, went up and introduced herself to Jessica, and pulled out her iPhone and asked if she would, uh, you know, critique some of her photographs and give her some tips. Nine or ten years old. This is where she wants to go. When she was done, there was a young woman behind her who was a college student who wanted to give her a website because she wanted some critique. And so Jessica's writing down the information and she says she's had a couple of good mentors. John White was one. And, and she named a couple of, and Jessica said, you don't need me. And she said, no, 
I need a woman's point of view. And, and so the, the, the desire is out there with young people. And, and I think it's a glimmer of hope for all of us yeah. that there are people that are truly interested in, in documenting and telling stories that help us understand what's going on in our increasingly complicated world. I think the biggest problem that you have right now is that there's so much. It's hard to get to it all. I mean, part of my job is just sit there and look on the internet and see what's there, and I can't keep up with it. I mean, I've got tons of friends that are in the business, and they're constantly pointing me at, at, at beautiful, beautiful storytelling, beautiful images, and I can't keep up with it. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. We could, we could do this all afternoon. I don't know what your time is like, but <laughs> I could do this all afternoon. William Snyder, Ken Geiger, thank you so much for your time, for your insight, for your work. Thank you for your questions. Come back and see us again. Our Pulitzer Gallery reopens in September. We're going to have newer technology. It'll be, as they say, bigger and better than ever. So come visit us. Thank you.